Welcome to the Private Property Podcast with myself, Zaman Dunga. And of course, from now on, we'll be bringing you this show every day during this lockdown. Uh, a lot of us as landlords or tenants have quite a lot of questions about what the impact of this lockdown is on our property portfolio um, or even on our property ambitions. And of course, on this show, we'll be bringing you different experts to help us navigate this uncharted territory and to really help us make sense of where we find ourselves in the property market. Now, coming up on today's show, it's going to be quite an interesting one. So, of course, the Reserve Bank governor um, announced earlier today that the repo rate has been cut by 100 basis points. And this essentially brings the South Africa's repo rate to 4.25%. And the cut will be effective from tomorrow. Now, the bank's decision will also lower the prime lending rate to 7.75%. Now, this comes after the bank brought the scheduled meeting that would have essentially happened in May forward to today. And of course, they are, they're, they're, they're responding to the COVID-19 crisis that we find ourselves globally. Um, the Reserve Bank Governor, Liseja Khanya, or rather, you know, was saying in the brief earlier today that the decision by the NPC to lower the interest rate was unanimous. So there's no confusion about the need for the repo rate to be decreased. Now, today's show will be unpacking what this essentially means if you've got a home loan um, or if you're looking to get into the property market, what the effects of a lower interest rate essentially are. Of course, you can always stay connected with us on Facebook as you're watching us. Um, as well as on our other social media platforms, whether it's Twitter or Instagram. And you can ask the questions that you would like us to, um, you know, address during this conversation. So if you're confused about what this um, decrease in the interest rates means, do send us your questions and we'll be addressing them. Now, tonight's show, I'm joined by Yaku Khobala, who is the Managing Director of Prosperity Enterprises. Now, Yaku, good evening. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good evening. Thank you very much. So I think before we even start with, you know, the breakdown of what this means for your home loan, perhaps take us through where we're finding ourselves uh, in terms of South Africa's property market right now. I mean, this is probably the first time that we're seeing three different interest rate cuts in such a short period of time. I mean, we saw the first one, of course, in January by 0.25%. And then there was one just less than a month ago, just before we went into the shutdown, that was also by 1%. And then, of course, today they're announcing another 1%. So 2.25% does have quite a big impact, um, even on the property market. Can you just take us through an overview of where we find ourselves in terms of the property market in South Africa? Thank you, Zamantungwa. Yes, we certainly do find ourselves in very, very interesting and very unique times. And uh, the interest rate cut today has been very, very good uh, uh, news to us. And also the previous cuts. Um, so just to, to touch on, on, on that and what that really means is you've got a monthly bond that you need to pay. And a big part of that bond is interest on the mortgage bond that you have. And with the interest rates being cut, it means that your monthly bond um, reduces. And if you are a property investor, that has a huge impact on your cash flow because as a property investor, you don't just have one property, you have many properties. And on each of those properties, suddenly your cash flow can significantly improve. But before we get to that, I'm doing well, I think a very, very important um, thing that you point out is to discuss where are we at in the property market? What is currently going on in the property market? Now, there are so many opinions out there. And for me, it is so important that one has perspective. The property market is certainly in a bias market, which means that there are significantly more sellers than what they are buyers. And what that means is that the buyers have got more leverage over negotiation than what the sellers has. And this has been the case before the COVID-19 crisis has taken place and before the um, global economic um, the, before the global economic dilemma that we are currently sitting with so basically what this crisis um, has done or will continue to do for quite some time i believe is it will push us even deeper into a bias market meaning that there will be even more people selling and even less people buying at least in the short term now this will be for many reasons. Uh, the main reasons obviously being economic reasons, people being uncertain, people not being sure if they want to invest, people uh, not being able to invest. There may be many people in times like these that cannot 
afford to have their property anymore and they have to sell it. They have no choice but to sell it. Mm -hmm. Now, for somebody that has a slightly longer term perspective and, and, and somebody that is really looking at building wealth, sustainable wealth um, through property investment, this is an absolutely perfect time to climb in and, and to start building your property portfolio. I recently read that Warren Buffett is sitting with over a hundred billion dollars of cash. Um, and he keeps that kind of cash ready for times like these when there's, when there's an opportunity to invest. And um, if you look at the greatest investors of all times, they have always, and, and, and that is just as applicable to property as to any other kind of investment, um, the best deals has always been made in the worst of times. The most investments, the most acquisitions um, of many of these investors were often made in the worst of times because that's when you can buy assets for cheap. That's where you can acquire assets at very, very good prices. And I believe that is where we currently find ourselves in the property market. And, uh, and, and just to come in here, I mean, the reality though is that there aren't that many people who are at that level, right? So there probably aren't a lot of people and they're probably watching us at home right now who are sitting on large cash reserves or relatively big cash reserves um, and are able to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Perhaps we should um, maybe break down, let's say, five types of people that we're probably going to find um, during this crisis, right? So the first one, of course, being somebody who already has a home, um, a home loan rather, and um, wondering whether they should be paying more right now. I mean, you always hear these tips around paying extra on your home loan and the advantages of paying extra in a home loan. Um, the second person, of course, would be somebody who um, has a home, so they're staying in their primary residence that's still bonded, but then they also have perhaps one or two, maybe even more um, rental properties. How can they take advantage of this? Because you typically tend to find that different people advise you differently in terms of your uh, how you structure your rental properties or how you pay into your um, various sort of bonds for your respective properties. So I want us to just first start with those two. I mean, there are other three. So the other three is perhaps you, you don't have a home loan at all. You're either, either renting or you're living at home and you've been kind of interested in property, but it's just been one of those question marks. Um, and another, of course, is perhaps you already started, you started looking and you've maybe spotted a few and you've gone into the private property website and already seeing that prices are saying price reduced as we keep seeing. So you can see that there's an impact and we've already, you're correct, we're already seeing prices going down before the COVID-19 crisis hit our shores. Um, and so maybe they're already contemplating making an offer and perhaps you have another person who's already made that offer and they're now thinking, wait, maybe I should rather wait out and, and not go through with that particular deal, maybe find a better deal um, because this one doesn't look so great. Um, so I think let's rather just unpack what this crisis essentially means for these types of people and how they can respectively um, you know, take advantage of, of this or how they can best cushion themselves so they don't find themselves um, in a financially tight situation. So I think let's start with sort of one of the sort of obvious ones, which is of course, people who already have a home loan um, and live in that primary residence, they don't have any other um, home loan. Should they be paying more? Should they be paying less? How can they navigate these, um, these times? I think what is very important is First and foremost, you need to have a plan in place. You need to have a strategy in place of where you are going. Uh, there are so many questions or so, many, so much advice being given on whether you should pay off a bond quicker, whether you should pay off a bond slower. Should you have a 20-year bond? Should you have a 30-year bond? In a time like this where interest rates are reducing, should you stick to your original payment and in that way pay off the bond quicker? Or should you use the extra cash flow that you have to maybe acquire more property. So uh, there's so many different options of what you can do. And the thing that you need to do first and foremost before anything else is you need to look where, are you, where you are currently at. Can you, can you afford, uh, can you af what can you afford at this stage? How is your budget looking? How is your cash flow looking? And also to plan for some of the, so for some of the concerns that might arise in this time. Um, I mean, we've, we've um, listened to interviews on private property speaking about what's the rental market going to look like and what are we going to do um, when there's tenants that have lost their jobs or that maybe can't pay their rent. So 
there is obviously a risk as well. And you need to take that into your plans into consideration as well. Um, when you are an investor that maybe doesn't just have a property that you are living in, but has investment properties. So the starting point before anything else is to know where you are at, to know what your budget or your, your cash situation or your investment situation is looking like, and then what your plan is to go forward. So many people find themselves or, or many people own one property and that is the property that they live in. Now, often that property that people live in can be a great investment property as well. So something that I would often encourage my clients to do is not to always see your primary residence just as a primary residence. Now, not all property necessarily lends itself to be great investment properties, but a lot of people live in a primary residence, which is a good investment property. And the first thing that I always challenge my clients with is to start looking at your primary residence as if it is an, is an investment property. Now, we often work with structuring and we would often use the example to say that you, you could, for example, not even own your primary residence. It could maybe be owned in a company or in a trust and yes. you could be renting from that entity because you know in two years or three years or four years or five years, you might move out, put a tenant in there and that property forms part of your investment property. So all of these things need to be considered. That being said, what should you do? Given your strategy, if, if, if it is a great time, of course, when you don't want to invest further and when you do have cash flow to push as much into your bond as possible because interests are low and that enables you to um, pay off much bigger chunks into your, or you can um, pay much bigger chunks into your capital and start paying the bond off. Um, that will enable you to pay off your home that you are staying in or your primary residence. But as a property investor, we often look at things from a completely different angle because cash in our hands are opportunities to invest. And, and the more access we've got to capital, the more deals we can make, the more properties we can acquire, and, and the greater wealth we can build. And in a time like this, I want to acquire as many properties as possible. So in that, when, when one looks from that angle, suddenly everything changes because you are not looking at how quickly you can pay off a bond. Instead, you are looking at how slowly can you pay off the bond, how little money needs to leave your pocket because that enables you to acquire more investment properties. So putting that in perspective, um, I often get the question, uh, should you take a 20 year bond or a 30 year, or 30 year bond? Yeah. Because, because I mean, a lot of, of, of this is related to exactly that. And I always say a 30 year bond and people would always ask me, but why on earth would you take a 30 year bond? And my response would always be the same because there's no 40 year bond available. And <laughs> the reason, and the reason, why we think like this is exactly what I've explained previously, that everything is about cash flow and investment. And the better your cash flow is, the bigger property uh, or the more investments you can make in property. So then you don't, then you would rather want to use that extra cash that you have to maybe buy another investment property. Now, okay. property. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I've got another um, question here. I'm going to, firstly, to finish, because I've actually got another question around um, whether you should pay off debt, so use this opportunity to be paying off other debts. So, of course, perhaps in addition to having a home loan or multiple home loans, you might be paying off your car, you might be paying off your credit card and, and other expenses uh, or other credit um, do we rather focus on that um, or go into um, perhaps buying another property? But before we get to that question, I think you're just um, finishing off a point. Uh, sorry, thanks. I think what is important or, or what, what the viewers can keep in mind is that a property empire is both one property at a time. You know, so we are talking about aspiring property investors. We are speaking about people that maybe don't own property yet or people that have one or two properties and they want to bolt that. And that gets done over a time period, step by step. Mm. And I think in times like these, and I mean, especially with lockdown as well, 
well, it's a great opportunity to sit back and to plan and to think what it is that you want to achieve and where it is you want to go and then to put a plan of action to work towards that. Because everything that we are discussing tonight, one would first need to refer back to that plan and see where it is that you want to go. So I, I love the question that you just asked, you know, and I, I think, I mean, it's such a subjective topic. So whatever I answer today, there are going to be people that agree with me and there's going to be people that completely disagree with me. Should you pay off debt now or should you acquire more debt? Yeah. Again, referring back to what your plan is. Now, I personally, although we take on a lot of debt for good investments, uh, what we refer to as good debt, I'm not fond of bad debt at all. And the reason for that is people often use debt to live above their means. They use debt to acquire things that they shouldn't actually be acquiring now because actually where they are at, they can't afford it now. So it's almost like trying to take a shortcut or cheating the system to try and get certain things. And in, in, in that regard, I'm not, I'm not very pro uh, debt in, 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 in things that's not going to grow in value. So having a car or having a clothing account or having a, a, a overdraft, that debt is, is most of the time used for living expenses. And a lot of those debts are at very high interest rates. So usually my advice would be to stay away from that kind of debt as far as possible. But then in the same breath, when it comes to good debt, debt that is being used to acquire assets that is growing in value and that is creating returns for me, there I'm very pro debt. And in a time like this, I would even acquire more debt. Okay. So if you're joining us at home or you've just joined us at home, of course, this is the Private Property Podcast. And tonight's topic, we are looking at what the lower interest rate means for your home loan. We're talking about some of the opportunities and perhaps risks um, in the property space, given the lower interest rates. For the first time, I think in South Africa, we've had three interest rate cuts within a space of um, three, three, four months. So the first one, of course, was in January. And then we had a second one uh, just last month. And today we had another interest rate cut. So that's 2.25% from January to today. And of course, there are different um, you know, sentiments around what this lower interest rate um, means, especially for people who either already have property or are looking to get into the property market um, and, and perhaps have question marks around how best to navigate this time or if this is the right time to buy. I think there have been so many questions around, is this now the right time to buy? And perhaps the question there is, what are you buying? Are you buying a home to live in? Are you buying an investment property? Um, or whatever the case is. So if you've got any questions or comments, do share them below on our Facebook page. You can also share them on Twitter and we'll be discussing them tonight. Now, Yaku, I think let's also now sort of look at what are the opportunities and risks um, during this particular time. I mean, you were saying earlier when we were speaking that when we look at a lot of the greatest investors, whether it's Warren Buffett or any others, um, a lot of them typically tend to have fairly large cash reserves. And a lot of their acquisitions are after a crisis like this, whether it is, was the financial crisis in 2008 or any other financial crisis. So they're able to take advantage of that particular opportunity. But similarly, people also make bad financial decisions thinking that perhaps this is a good investment or this is the step in the right direction. So what are some of the opportunities and risks given the lower interest rates uh, with, with specifically in the property market? Right. As mentioned, we are finding our ourselves in times where there are great buying opportunities. So there are great investment properties out there. Um, we believe that there were great investment properties out there before the crisis and after the crisis that will just escalate. So the opportunities out there, the properties are out there. Properties are selling at very, very good prices. Over the last um, number of years, we've seen very slow growth in property because of the times that we find ourselves in. So it is a buyer's market. Prices are good. The opportunity is out there. There are, however, important things that needs to be in place before 
you go out and, and take advantage of, of those opportunities. The first thing that I want to say, and, and, and that's very, very important because there's, there's different ways that we can approach that uh, and, and, and how, to, how to sort this out, but cash is king. So wherever you are at now, I think it is a very, very important um, aspect to look at in your portfolio is what is your cash reserves looking like? And what can you do to improve those cash reserves? So if, if you, especially if you want to acquire more property, so the opportunity is there, the property is out there, but the last thing that you want to do is overextend yourself now. It, it's, it's almost like a five-year-old uh, walking into a five-story candy shop. You, you know, is, is, you want to control this. And, yeah. and you want to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where you overexpose yourself or where you maybe acquire a lot of properties and then interest rate starts rising at a later stage again. So all of that needs to be taken into consideration. You can't have a big property portfolio with no cash. You're looking for trouble. And you can't be buying more and more and more properties and not have cash as reserves. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can get cash. You don't necessarily always have to save up for it. A lot of people are sitting with properties that have equity in it. Wow. Now, again, we are referring to a specific strategy. So this is not applicable to somebody that wants to settle their debt now and, and remain or, or have a very slow growth in their property portfolio. There's nothing wrong with that. That strategy is just going to look different. But for somebody that wants to invest now, often a good thing to do is just to get your cash position better. And one of the ways that we often do that, because structuring is so important as well, is we, what, what, what a lot of investors do when they start out is they move their properties from their personal name into their structures. And they, so in other words, their entity, their trust or their company purchases the property from them, it is refinanced at the new market value or it is purchased and financed at the market value. And that creates a lot of cash and capital that becomes available to now start building a property portfolio. Now, my advice to my clients then is always don't go use all of that money to buy more property. Keep some of that money back. My personal rule is that you should have 10% cash reserves of the value of your properties. Now, that sounds like a lot. But that means you can still gear 90%, which is a very, very high gearing ratio. Um, there's a reason why they don't say equity is king. They say cash is king, and there's a big difference. Because you can have equity in a property, but if you don't have cash and you find yourself in trouble, it's not necessarily going to help you much. Yeah. So you can still gear very aggressively. You can still finance a lot of properties, but don't do that without having cash reserves in place. We often refinance properties to make cash available. We keep it in the access bonds so that we don't uh, pay interest on that money that we have refinanced, but we keep it there as reserves so that we have sufficient reserves in our portfolio. In a business, you would call it working capital. Mm. In, in, in our property portfolios, we call it cash reserves for, for, um, for all the different things that can happen. So speaking of the risks, as we said, the crisis can affect the rental market significantly. And rental collections, vacancies, defaults, all of those things can become a significantly bigger problem in the next couple of months than what it was. Now, I factor those costs into the cost of my investment. So when I'm buying a property now, I'm not just thinking of the purchase price of the property. I'm thinking of the possible higher vacancy that the property might have in the short run. It's not to say that it will be, that there will be more vacancy, but a lot of people suspect that could be the case or the possible higher defaults on rent payments. And I factor those costs into my investment that I'm making in the, in the property. But it's not just about factoring those costs into your investment. It's actually about making provision for them. And for that, you need cash. So you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of the table. You don't want to find yourself in a position where you maybe lose your job or where you maybe can't afford your bond or where you find yourself in trouble and now you can't 
now you can't um, honor your commitments. So from that regard, you have to make provision first and foremost. You, 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 you can't, you, you have to have fat, you have to build up reserves, you have to um, make sure when you are entering this time, whether it is just to reserve or to protect what you have, or whether it is to grow, that you've got enough fat, that you have enough reserves with you to go through this time, irrespective of, of whether you want to grow or just protect what you have. Now, Yaku, we've got um, some questions that are coming in. Of course, if you want to have some of your questions answered, you can ask them below and we'll be addressing them tonight. Of course, we're talking about what the lower interest rate means for your home loan or your property ambitions. Now, this question comes from Val Kabea uh, Chiombo, um, who asks, can we know if a standalone or block of flats will make sense at this stage? Because we need to look at risk of repayment. It's, it's a very good question but it is, it is also a very difficult question to answer. I don't think a, a lot of people have opinions of, of what collections are going to look like and what defaults are going to look like in the next three to six months or in the next 18 months even. But it is, it is very difficult to say that this is, this is what's going to happen. This is how the economy is, is, is this is how things are going to go. This is how many people are not going to be able to pay their rent. So are those investments or could those investments still be very good investments? Absolutely. But you do need to factor in the risk aspects. You do need to factor in the, um, the, 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 the risks that comes along with that, especially in this time. And it's going to actually be quite interesting to look at um, that rental behavior or the payment behavior yeah, from people. I mean, I remember earlier this month, um, TPN data was showing that 24.16% uh, of tenants were listed as did not pay for April. And that was already on the 7th. So you'd have, um, and, and a lot of the landlords, some of them, I suppose, were, were, were quite finicky, right? Because on the one hand, um, we're all understanding that we are finding ourselves in a crisis right now. And there are probably people who are not going to be in the best position to be able to pay. Um, and on the other hand, landlords also have their rent, their bond payments that they need to make. And this was actually something that we've covered in one of our episodes. So if you've missed that episode, do um, scroll into our Facebook page and you can listen in on that um, episode we did with um, Michelle Dickens from TPN, as well as uh, Maya Fisher French, who's an award-winning journalist. We're looking at, you know, how do you best navigate this as a landlord who has a tenant uh, and a tenant who either hasn't paid or a tenant who might not be able to pay on time. Uh, TPN actually released... Um, I think it's a, it's a rental, essentially, essentially a rental package to help you, you know, enter into a new contract if you want to be able to use the, the deposit that's been used. So legally entering into that new contract or if um, the tenant is going to defer the rental by a certain percentage. So if you have question marks around how to best navigate that, we've already covered that on episode two of the Private Property Podcast. So do uh, watch out for that. Now, um, Yaku, I think one of the other things then um, we want to look at is already we're seeing that there are people who are, you know, perhaps already have their feet, uh, or, uh, you know, in the water in terms of their property portfolio, and perhaps they have two or three um, properties. How can they best position themselves right now? Um, and, let, and let's argue, maybe they didn't buy in the best structure, maybe you've bought in your personal capacity because you were still kind of starting out, and only now are you slowly learning about you know, structuring and moving your things into a PTY or a trust. So how can they best position themselves to be able to take advantage of this lower interest rate? Right. Restructuring is often a great opportunity, not just to get the assets in the right entities, but also to make a lot of capital available, as I said. So many of my clients, very often, I sit with a client that has two or three properties, actually the majority of my clients, um, it is owned in their own name. And by moving that over into a more formalized or a more structured structure, you know, a company or a trust with its own financial statements, its own bank account, etc. In other words, running their property portfolio more like a proper business. Um, through that, they also make a lot of capital available because when they move those properties to their trust or their company, 
their trust with their company, one of the approaches that you can take, purchases that property from you at market value and it gets financed at market value, which means that if, um, if you have a property that you, that you have an outstanding bond of 700,000 Rand on, but the property is worth a million Rand now, if it gets financed at a million Rand, that's 300,000 Rand of cash that comes to you that, you, that, that is made available through this process. Now, of course, there's costs of restructuring that one must not um, overlook, but, but that creates an opportunity, I always say, to kill two birds with one stone, because not only are you getting your structures right, you are also making capital available. That's step one. Now step one is covered with step two, you are sitting with sufficient reserves, you are probably you are probably far over the 10% example that I use where you want to have 10% cash um, to the value of your property portfolio if you've restructured. And now you can use some of that additional capital or available capital that you have to purchase additional property at very, very good prices in the current market. And so, I mean, Yaku, on that, and, and I know we'll probably call you back for another interview where we look at structure, because I think that's also a, a topic on its own um, that can get very mm -hmm. technical. And it's, it essentially needs people who are already have, you know, whether you're, you're ready to essentially buy or you already have a portfolio and you're looking at practical um, tips in how to restructure. And the example that you've given um, where you're saying that you've got clients who typically would have perhaps two or three properties, um, and they'll buy the and they in their personal name and perhaps their PTY will buy the the properties um, from their personal name, and it gets refinanced and they're able to have um, you know cash to essentially work with. In that particular transaction, are they then um, who's who stands as surety? Because suppose you go and you go into CIPC right now and. Uh, you're able to register your business. We know in two days it will be done. You open your bank account in a week, all that admin is sorted and you go to the bank. Um, obviously now this new company hasn't been operating. They can't really show any income or expenditure. So are they standing a surety in their personal capacity, even though the ownership yes. structure is now yes. of course in that particular PTY? Definitely. Uh, the individual, whether it is the director or the trustee would still need to sign surety for, for, um, for the transaction that's taking place in the entities. As you said, later on those entities are having, they become more independent as, as the property portfolio grows and, and the income or the profits in the entity grows. Okay, we've got more questions. Of course, if you're watching us at home, you can send through your questions and we'll be addressing them. Uh, the next question comes from Mtenjo Amtolo, who is asking, will the, current rent, will the current crisis also reduce the current rental rate? And if my property is due for lease renewal, what, what would be the best increase percentage, 4 to 6%, or should one go lower? That's a fantastic question by Mtenjo. Um, and I'm very, very happy asked that because up until now, we've only focused on the one side. So interest rates are coming down, our bonds are coming down, but what is going to happen to actual rent being received? Um, everything, everything works with supply and demand, every, every, you know? And, and the answer that I usually give when I'm asked about rental escalations and about the rent that you can ask, you can only ask what the market is willing to pay. So if there are 10 units in a complex that's renting out for 6,000 Rand, you are not going to get seven and a half or 8,000 Rand. The market determines the price and, and the new price is at 6,000 Rand. Now, if you had a tenant in there for seven and a half thousand Rand and you now want to push it up with say somewhere between five and 10% or whatever that percentage is, and you, for example, want 8,000 Rand now, if the tenant sees, but there's other properties renting for 6,000 Rand, all they are going to do is say, thank you very much. I'm canceling my lease or I'm not, not uh, renewing my lease. I am rather going to move to, to one of those properties. So whenever I have properties in my property portfolio going vacant, the first thing that I do is I go onto private property and I actually see what are similar properties renting out for because that is the price that's being determined by the market. 
if, 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 if there's too many properties that offers the same than what my properties offers, but the price is lower, I'm not going, going to get a tenant. So that is something that we will have to look at. Now, this is where it becomes very interesting. And I think there will be a lot of opinions around that. Um, is demand for rental property going to decrease? Where are all those tenants going to go to? Because everybody still needs to stay somewhere. So people might move in the, in the um, you know, people might downgrade or people might move to cheaper properties or um, the type of tenant. So, so, so the, the demand overall is not going to decrease for property. The population is still what the population is. There's not suddenly less people that want to rent. So from that regard, the demand is still there. But where the demand is decreasing is the number of tenants that are good to be a tenant for you. Because a lot of people's credit records or affordability can be negatively affected through a crisis like this, which means that the number of good tenants or tenants that you would be willing to place in your unit, that might reduce. And where that reduces in, in, in demand, as we are taught in economics, that also brings down or could bring down prices. So there's, there's, there's a good chance that, there's a, there's a very good chance that, I mean, rental escalations has been low the last couple of years. Uh, I personally believe there's a very good chance that those rental escalations could even be lower or that there might even be decreases. Um, in the rent that you can charge on, on your properties. So to answer Mtenja's question, once you approach renewal, you have to look at what is in the market, what other similar units are renting out for, and, and base your decision on that. And I think, Mtenja, I mean, if you, if you go and listen to episode two, this was also something that we did cover um, on, on episode two, when we're looking at some of the financial relief or the financial implications of this particular of the COVID nineteen crisis um, in property, whether you're a landlord or a tenant, so it really is worth going back and listening into you know particularly that section around um, the effect to your credit score because there are tenants who might be scared that their uh, credit score might be affected because they are going to be paying their rental late. So there are ways to mitigate that and ensure that your credit score also doesn't decrease. And as a landlord, there are also tips that we give you that in the event where you've had a tenant who's been staying in your uh, particular property for an extended period of time, and they've been a fairly good tenant, there certainly isn't any need, especially in this economic climate, to be increasing that rental, especially when you as a landlord might have other ways to, to um, where take that cost fund financially, so whether you're going into a conversation with your bank, and of course with lower interest rates, um, they essentially do help you as a landlord. Uh, we've got another question here, Yaku, from Michael uh, Faniker, who asks, how will the banks evaluate their ability for loan repayments in light of the after effects of lockdown and uncertainty about job stability? Also, also a very good question. Um, a couple of points that I want to make. So banks are in the business of lending first and foremost. So the revenue of a bank is interest. So that is, that is the income, but banks only want to lend to people that are obviously going to pay them back. So in a case like this, where there's more instability, where there's um, higher risk for the bank, because that's in effect what's happening a lot of banks might or, or could take a much more conservative stance and be more careful to lend, which could make it more difficult for you to, to get financing or the banks might have stricter requirements before they would give, would give a loan. Now that's completely my opinion. Um, I'm just, just looking at basic economic fundamentals, um, that is something that you have to take into consideration. So, the, the risk factor is definitely increasing for, for a lot of people. Um, but banks also don't want to stop doing business. So if there are people out there that's got good income, that's, that's got, um, we, we, there's their safety in, 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 in the occupation or in the income that they have, their affordability is good, they've got a good credit record. 
banks would still be willing to lend to people like that. Okay, and then we've got another question here that asks, um, and it's from Val uh, Kiyombo, who asks, will the area matter at this stage? Will high market properties um, be a high risk? Uh, because tenants in such areas may not be able to afford 20 or 30K per month. Also, also yeah. in question, often you see in, in times like these or in times of crises that your more luxury property has um, falls further than your entry level property, for example. And that's got very much to do also with supply and demand because, and it's exactly as Val said in, in the question there, is everybody needs to stay somewhere. So, so, so a lot of people may downgrade, but, but in, in, in which price brackets, how is the movement between the price brackets going to be? A lot of people, when they find themselves in difficulty, might need to downscale and there might be few, uh, much fewer or, or there, there might be so many fewer people that can afford, for example, maybe a property in the three or the four or, or the five million rand mark, um, which creates a great opportunity of buying at great prices in those price brackets, but also there's a reason why you're buying it at such great prices. And in the short run, especially, you know, from a, from a rental perspective, the, the demand will decrease or could decrease drastically. And also your affordability needs to be right for that. But um, if you are thinking of buying a nice luxury property in this time and you have cash, now is certainly a very, very good time to do that. Um, and, and, and Yaku, we've got another question here. You've partially answered, uh, you know, an aspect of the question. Um, the, the, it starts off by saying the decrease in the repo rate enables more people to switch from being tenants to homeowners. However, will the banks require company stability in order to determine that prospective buyers are able to repay their home loans? That's, that's an extremely good question. We're really getting great questions uh, tonight. Um, so you're sitting with a balancing scale. You're sitting with the two sides because on the one side, and 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 it, it, I think to a big extent the one is trying to cover the other one. Um, on the one side, we are sitting with um, interest rates coming down, that making it more affordable uh, to have a property, to own a property, or to have debt. It enables many more people to actually get a bond, to um, afford a bond. So. In on that side, all is good. But on the other side, you are sitting with more um, uncertainty, with more concern from the bank's perspective of, of um, employment stability or income stability, for example. And the banks are definitely going to look at both sides of that. If, if, if the question is which side is going to win, I don't have the answer to that. But yes, the banks are, are definitely going to, from an affordability perspective, if you still have the same income, you'll be able to qualify for a bigger bond now okay, okay. Because, yeah. of, because of the bond being more affordable. But from a risk perspective or from an uncertainty perspective, the banks might be less willing to lend because of, because of um, instability in the market. So, so it's, it's a balancing scale between the two. Okay, and we're going to be slowly wrapping up. I've got another uh, question from Tendra. It seems that the issue of restructuring um, is quite a popular one. And, 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 and as I said, we'll probably cover that topic by itself because it's quite a big and a chunky one um, yeah. and has different layers and almost want to guide people in how to best structure it from the beginning. And then perhaps once you already have a property portfolio, how do you then work around restructuring it at that point? Now, um, Tendra, asks if the PTY buys from the my personal name will they will there not be um, any capital gains tax and transfer and bond registration fee yes they will so not you not all scenarios is good for restructuring in in that regard sometimes you need to look at other alternatives like um, for example uh, asset for share swap which we won't be able to get into tonight but different ways in which you can do that restructuring where you can reduce the capital gains, where you can reduce the transfer duties, etc. Um, the, sh the, the, the shorter answer to that question is that 
in, in, in certain instances, the restructuring makes a lot of sense, especially when the capital gain is not too much and it's not too much, not a too expensive property. So up until a million rand, there's no transfer duties. And that's usually a good benchmark for me as well. Any property below a million rand that hasn't had too much capital gain is perfect for restructuring. But when you are looking at a two or a three million rand property and there's maybe 500,000 or a million rand capital gain already, then we need to look at a more sophisticated uh, restructuring approach because the transfer duties and the capital gains tax is going to be too much. Now, a question from Felix Sydney says, a friend of mine wants to refinance her property, but um, her credit score is on minus and they, they're self-employed and no hope of getting money, but the bank didn't approve her refinancing. Uh, what must she do? Uh, must she sell her house? Or must she sell a house because she said since the property is used as collateral, she cannot explain why she was declined. So what's the best approach in that one? You know, there's a joke that goes around, um, banks only lend money to people that don't actually need money. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it is unfortunate that if, if, if you find yourself in a position where you are tight or where your credit score is bad, you are going to struggle to get financing or to refinance a property. And your first priority, well, I mean, if you can't afford it, then we now start to talk about what's the next plan. But you'll only be able to refinance or get new bonds if, if you have a strong enough or a good enough credit record. So um, I always say in our seminars as well, that a credit record, my credit record is sacred to me. Debit orders are sacred to me. I, I, I do whatever I can, but a debit order cannot bounce in my books, in, in my accounts. And, and the same with my credit score. I, I need to have the highest credit score possible because that enables me to bolt my empire, to acquire properties, to refinance when I need to refinance, all of that. But if you do find yourself in a place where you already have a bad credit record, um, and, and many of us has been there in the past. You have to look at, can I get out of this without refinancing? Because you're not going to get refinancing. So will I be able to get through this? And while I get through this, what can I do to improve my credit record again and, and to get a good credit score so that maybe in the future, I can take out a new bond for a new property or refinance a property. If that is not possible and you will not be able to afford the pro, uh, to, 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 to work with the budget that you will have, then obviously one would have to look at more extreme measures. Um, Yakuna, our final question from our viewers at home comes from Pilani uh, Luiana, who asks, which way is, ooh, there goes my foot. He, um, they ask, which way is the best way when buying a property? Buy on your name or use a trust? We're definitely going to have to do a session on structuring as well. <laughs> so, or a popular one, I can see. Ask, ask, ask three people how you should buy a property and you will get three different opinions. Different yeah. so, and and um, I, I can literally speak for the next three hours about, about this question, but I'm going to give a, a, a short um, question that, or a short answer that might not answer all the elements, but, but, but it, it will give you a good guideline. Um, the example that I always use is that if, if you have a business and you run a business through your personal savings account and your income is coming through your personal savings account or your personal account, your expenses is going out there and you are getting to a point where you want to expand that business and you want to get funding or financing and you want to bolt this business. Not a lot of people are going to take you seriously because there's no structure. There's no... There's no professionalism to the approach of how you're building this. If you've registered that business in a company, in a PTY, with its own bank account and its own financial statements, and now you want to get financing or funding, obviously funders and financiers will take you more seriously because there's more structure to your investment. Now, why is it different with property investment? If you are building a property portfolio, this is your business, and you need to run it like a business. So my advice always is, to have your properties in an entity such as a trust or a company. Now, if you really want to, if you really want to get different opinions, ask people whether you should be buying in a company or whether you should be buying in a trust. 
Now that's a very difficult question to answer. A lot of, a lot of people say in a company, but there are also people that say in a trust. And in certain instances, a trust often for, for people that are just starting out, there are great opportunities like with the conduit principle to buy your properties directly in a trust where you can distribute the profits and the capital gains to the beneficiaries, which you can't necessarily do in a company. But, but, but for me, structuring is very important. And if, if you are looking at building a property portfolio, and I'm not necessarily talking about you just want to buy one property and you've got no intention of going further than that. But if you do want to build a property portfolio, uh, structuring is very, very important. Now, Jakob, before I let you go, any top three tips that you'd like to give our viewers at home um, who are, whether they're already in the property space, maybe they are um, got two or three rental properties, or they're looking to get into the uh, property space right now, what are the three tips that you would give uh, for them, especially seeing that we're currently facing historically low interest rates, and it is fertile ground right now for property investments, as you were saying earlier, that it's a biased market. Right. So I want to give, I want to give a couple of tips. Um, something that I maybe want to do while we are wrapping up is I want to put myself in somebody's shoes that's maybe thinking of, of buying a property now or building their property portfolio. And the question is, what would I have done right now if I was in that position? The first thing that I would have done is I would have put a plan in place. What, what, where am I going to? Uh, what is my direction? What is it that I want to achieve? And what are the steps going to be to get there? Because before I have that in place, I can be all over the show and, and, and don't know where I, I want to go. If it was me, I would have obviously want, said that I want to build a property portfolio. And what I would have done that then is two things. I almost want to say again to balance the scale. I would have made sure I get access to as much cash as possible and, and make my cash reserves as strong as possible. And I would have in the same breath looked at how many properties I can acquire in, in a time such as this, because prices um, are going to be very, very good. So uh, to break that up into tips, um, this sounds very bad. Um, I, I, I want to say prepare for the worst, but, but, but that sounds very, that sounds very negative, but, but, what I mean by that is, is make sure that you are prepared for some curveballs that might come your way if you are buying. That does not mean property is a bad investment. That, that does not mean you shouldn't be buying property now. Absolutely. I don't think there's a better time than what the next six or 12 or 18 months will show. So, but be prepared for some curveballs. And what I mean by that is have some reserves in place, especially if you are looking at investment property as well. If you are looking at, at buying a home for yourself, also a great time to buy property for yourself now. But again, be prepared, um, um, have a close look at your situation that you are in. How stable are you? Is your income at this stage? How is your budget looking? How is your affordability looking? The last thing that you want to do in a time like this is overexpose yourself and spread yourself too thin because the opportunity is there. Like I said, it's like a five-year-old walking into a five-story can, uh, five candy store. Uh, there is so much opportunity out there. There's so much that you can do now, but don't spread yourself too thin. And, and, and what I mean by that is make sure you have cash reserves as you venture out and build and, and, and acquire property. So Yaku's three tips essentially are put a, put a plan in place, um, you know, prepare for the worst and look at your financial situation so you can be best able to make an assessment. Yaku, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, that is Yaku Hobela, who is the Managing Director of Prosperity Enterprises. And of course, for more of these conversations, you can always watch our Facebook page, uh, where we will be coming to you live every day during the, every weekday during the lockdown at 7 p.m., bringing you experts, unpacking different property issues. If you have any topics um, that you'd like us to cover, do drop them below and we'll definitely explore them with our experts. And of course, for your rental, sale, and buying needs, go to privateproperty.co.za. I've been your host, Zamando 
Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Until tomorrow night.